So Bill, your company CNDG has been delivering Second Life modules for higher education for over 10 years now. You guys do stuff differently. How? What differentiates what we do from many other iterations of distance learning is that we are virtual worlds learning. Students begin to sense that they are present to each other. Avatar and Avatir become one. A good example for this is what we built for Professor William Landing at the Environmental Science Department at Florida State University. So now <laughs> I'm in Antarctica, it's snowing like crazy. This fellow's dressed appropriately, I'm still wearing my, uh, my Hawaiian shirt. In this module, the students take a helicopter to a drill site and over there they dig and examine ice cores. Hundreds of thousands of years of ice has been piled up. As the ice accumulates, it traps air pockets of what the atmosphere looked like 400 or 800,000 years ago. And we can go down that core, going back in time, and look at the composition of the atmosphere. The HUD, which you can see on the side of your screen, tells you all the instructions you need. We also give students a, a data set which corresponds to what you would typically find in those ice cores. They can pretend that they're going down the core and then they see little bits of volcanic ash which were captured when a volcano somewhere in the world erupted and spewed ash into the atmosphere. The tension between my being very aware of the fact that I'm sitting here and I can see my world, and I can see the physical things around me, and at the same time, psychologically entering the space and talking to you as my avatar, talking to your avatar. Yeah, that's this immersion that you feel, even though I know I'm looking at a computer screen. Like, I feel like I'm moving, I'm walking. The sense of presence in the environment is real. The live networked interaction between teaching assistants and students is vital to maintaining that sense of presence. So it creates a community of teachers as well as a community of learners. It empowers them and it energizes them. My name is Xu Chen. I am teaching assistant in Introduction in Environmental Science Lab. We have four hours each week. So this is time machine and it can transport us to a lab and we can do the lab there. This semester, you can both be in Second Life while you are also in the office. Students often ask about specific lab assignments. For example, the one about the deforestation. In this one, you'll go back in time to Easter Island. Okay, let's walk to the trees and uh, see what's happening. In this example, you go forward in time and see how tree cover disappears over hundreds of years. Those tools, that is for you to count the trees. This course is designed for non-science majors, and most of them have never even thought about something like this before. They might have heard about that we're cutting down the, you know, the tropical rainforests. But here, they actually get to experience the effect. It is possible to increase empathy for the subjects that you're studying and for the students with whom you're studying and the people with whom you're studying. The goal is to give them an appreciation for the natural environment, a desire to protect it. So in the marine lab that we built, you can scuba dive underwater and actually examine fish populations. I have to put on my scuba gear, mm -hmm. I select my tanks, the heads up display is telling me what to do next. So I go and talk to the researcher. There should be a yellow bell buoy marking the spot and there's a yellow bell buoy. I'm now on the coral reef. There's three activities I have to do. I have to count the native fish. I have to count the lionfish. The natural fish are the ones that keep the coral clean and healthy because they eat the algae that grow on the coral. Students will email me and say, I, I did the lionfish transect, but I missed some. Can I go back and, and do them again? It's like, yes, you can. <laughs> The social and emotional learning, which is a connectedness between human persons, is essential in order to ensure that people will want to go on, continue to learn, and to teach others and to move knowledge forward. And I should be recording my observations. Get my fake lab book out here. So this is time, and this is the initial time, and I got 26 lionfish. The sense that I am bilocated is what creates that sense of presence in the virtual environment.
now, Professor Landing is teaching at Florida State University in Tallahassee. CNDG also has running modules at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. How come you guys focus on Florida so much? The Florida education system is unique, where each institution is independent, but they also have common core curricular elements. Pearson Education is our partner. They're the largest educational publisher in the world. We co-sponsored with them a conference about STEM education in Gainesville. We presented a lunch panel with some of our local faculty to try and point the conversation towards teaching in virtual environments as opposed to allowing automated virtual environments as single user experiences to replace teachers. We fielded part of our team to the conference, so our Chief of Operations, Annie Simonhart, was there with us as well. The conference has been very much based around different ways of delivering STEM. There are a lot of people in the audience that were like, is this real? And there were some questions about the validity of it. How much is this going to cost me? Because if it's going to cost me a lot, I don't want to do it. It looks expensive, it's too flashy stick with the textbook. Well, no, you know, you as faculty, it costs you absolutely zero. The development costs are recouped from sales, and if we're selling it as a textbook, that's where the money to fund it is coming from. My name is Stephanie Dillon. I'm the director of Freshman Laboratories for Chemistry. Chemistry was viewed by students as the most difficult of all the subjects they could take, so it was undersubscribed. General chemistry courses are very necessary from physics, biology, engineering, any allied health. And so we built a CSI-styled murder mystery in which the students have to use the chemistry that they're learning in order to solve the question of how these clues lead them to the actual murder. Experiential learning in the virtual world, let's group the two together, think of it as anecdotes. When you're trying to explain something to somebody, an idea or a concept or a notion, a lot of the times what you do is draw on an anecdote or something that you have associated with the concept that you're trying to explain. They remember the process that they did the apparatus, the chemistry, because it is unique. They have to look at how evidence is collected, what blood samples mean as trace evidence. You're visually going to, you know, recall being in that virtual environment. And the course skyrocketed and it went from having 19 students a year to having close to 900 students a year. They've had students who have said, wait a minute, Science is really interesting stuff. These courses, by making it so accessible, teaches students that if they're willing to put the time and effort in, they are capable of being a scientist. You got to get them in the door. There is still this idea that learning is not supposed to be fun, but if you're having fun, it doesn't invalidate getting information from other people in terms of lectures and stuff like that. There is no reason why the two can't coexist. My name is Michelle Yergain, and I am the laboratory coordinator at the University of Central Florida. Books are two-dimensional. Why not be able to walk through a cell and experience it? Activities that could anchor those concepts better for the students. And the point is, is that they then understand what they're doing because instead of just looking at it as an abstract concept, it becomes a real event for them. I definitely see the students communicating with each other more in Second Life because they're not afraid. It is their avatar. They can just ask their question even if they might perceive that their question is a stupid question. It's become easier for the students to approach the faculty staff in the environment themselves. It's almost like a safe space. You have to differentiate between collaboration and cheating. In an environment where we are allowing them to work together, just as if they were in a face-to-face -face lab, they're going to help each other out. That's what we want. It's why we chose this type of an environment versus just an online lab platform. So Joe Calhoun presented us with a different challenge. I used to do this in the classroom, but in a large class, I could only ask for 10 volunteers and everybody else would just sit and watch. Joe Calhoun, who is the director of the Stavros Center for Economics Education, he had exercises to elucidate certain points. We worked directly with them to kind of build out the scenarios. The one that we first talked about with him was a trading exercise which he would use to demonstrate. A trade creates value. Mm -hmm. So here is the trading center. And this is where the whole idea for me to engage students in Second Life came alive. Economics is the science of people making choices. 
So we've got butterfly wings, we've got hats and some headphones, and just some fun things that should have some value to them. They have the ability to trade. So once I get into the place I was instructed to go to, then I'm, it's revealed to me what I have. And I have the floppy hat. And they have the skates. And I say, wow, that, that's something that I would like. I would rather have the skates than the floppy hat. So I offer to trade. So now that person has the hat and I have the skates. Now, if I wanted to, I could click on this other person and say, well, what do you have? Now, they have a monocycle. Now, that's actually more appealing to me than skates. Now, what I'm going to do is offer that, and it doesn't look like he's willing to trade me. He says no. It's a very engaging, interactive environment, and we keep them moving through the module by having students use their avatar and walk around through their avatar. They don't want to multitask. They don't want to let their avatar just stand in one place while they jump to a website and watch a YouTube video for three minutes. I'm Anna Vill, studying public relations at Florida State University. So there's one module where we fight zombies. You are being contracted by an agency to go kill these zombies and they pay you per head. The idea behind the so-called zombie module, which is officially titled production class, is we're trying to get students to understand the decisions that people make when they go to work. You're learning the value of saving up to buy better materials to conduct this business. You can earn more profit by killing more zombies, and you also learn the value of contracting somebody, but not contracting too many people to work under you because then you're not making money because you have to pay them. It's very American. <laughs> One way that you become comfortable is by being familiar. Many of them, they don't have any gaming experience in their life. They're all millennials, but they're not necessarily gamers. There, there is a difference there. Distance learning and online education is flat information dissemination. Virtual worlds education is not a fantasy. It's just a place we go. Thank you, Bill. That's fascinating stuff, and I'm glad I was able to tag along. Now, you do go places in the physical world, as we've seen. You also go to the actual Linden Lab head offices in San Francisco every once in a while. And your core team recently met in London for your yearly brainstorming session. Now, I'm wondering, we have not addressed this in this piece. Is CNDG exploring next generation virtual worlds at all? Well. Drax, we're not really ready to talk about that yet. We have our hands full in Second Life, and we have no plans to abandon it at all. The content and the learning objectives are the key to what we do, so anything which moves the bar forward is of interest to us. From our point of view, what we are doing is producing the textbook of the future. How it's going to be delivered, we're not sure yet. Wait a minute, Drax. You didn't play any clips from the presentation in Gainesville at the STEM conference. Oh, oh yeah, you got me. Have we run out of time already? Uh, we have a little bit of time left. Let's, let's play one. How many of you have a particular instructor, teacher, professor that you can remember from any level of education in which you said, I want to be like that person? Can you imagine saying, I want to be like that machine? or that robot, and that, that just wiped it out right there. Imagine for yourselves, if distance meant nothing, and if you could be in a virtual space together, in real time, present to one another, it's taking the inspiration of who I want to be and what I want to learn and what I want to carry on that will create the next generation of people who will move human knowledge forward, and that's what we're about.